Howdy folks, welcome back. We're going to tear into this Oliver OC46 crawler. We basically had to strip it down to an engine, a transmission, and a differential housing. The tracks had to come off, the track frames had to be lowered down. This frame here on the inside of the tracks has to be lowered. The final drives have to come out and then we can finally pull the differential steering clutch assembly out the back. To remove the track on this old machine we had to drive out the master pin. So there's cotter pins, split pins on either side. Take those out and then we should be able to drive that pin all the way through. But before we can do that, we have to loosen the track. Well, there's an adjuster here. It's old school, done with a, a thread, essentially. It takes an inch and five-eighths wrench. I was able to get the jam nut loose, but that's as far as I was able to get. The other side, I can't even get the jam nut loose. So we'll get the torch over here heat this stuff up and see what we can do. Yeah. There we go. I did have to heat that one, the inside of this link here to get that pin to come out, but yeah, not too bad. Have a hard time believing that's the original bolt. You want what? You want the Paw Patrol board game? That seems 
has something to bring up with mom. Well, I thought we could slide that final drive out of there without having to drop that loader frame, but it's not going to work. You see the axle shaft sticks through too far, so even with our carved out notches here in the frame, it's not enough. So, yeah, what are you going to do? It's not the end of the world. We've got to pull these four bolts out on either side and then the whole carcass of the machine will come up out of that loader frame. Well, fun fact, the drain plugs in the final drive are 5 sixteenths square. There we go. Luckily I had a piece of 5 sixteenths key stock kicking around. Alright, we're going to pull the brake bands out, hopefully. I backed off the adjusters so they're nice and loose. And this is the point in the video, the second video, where I have now released the first video into the wild. And I got a massive number of comments from people saying that this left side brake band wasn't working, that it wasn't, wasn't adjusted properly or whatever, wasn't in, engaging. So it wasn't causing the clutch to disengage. Except for the part where the whole engine tries to stall out whenever you pull this left side brake. So it is definitely working. I don't know why I'm getting so many comments like that. But I guess that's the way it goes. A lot of people are really concerned about the difference in adjustment from left to right as well. Uh, that doesn't make any difference. I mean, not really. The actual adjustment's all done outside, outside of the differential housing. I'll show you guys in a minute. Okay, so that looks pretty good, I think. Now, if I understand this right, the whole thing should just kind of roll out of there. I see the problem.
We gotta pull these pins out. Now this should come down. There we go. So now we should be able to just kind of roll this out of here. There we go. Cool. Man, what a mess. So the actual adjustment of the steering clutches is, or brakes is done with this big nut right here. So. What's on the inside is, I don't know, I, I want to say it's not important, but as long as you can adjust it out here, it doesn't really matter. So the last piece of the puzzle, we got to pull this cap off here. It's like a bearing cap. So that sets the preload on the, the bearings and the differential and, you know, kind of sets the, the ring gear depth. What's nice about this is they made it a separate piece, so you don't have to try to stick the final drive up there and do all your adjustments, because that would be impossible. That's nice. They gave us a couple of threaded holes here we can use to work this out if we need to, you know, to pull the bearing cap out. There we go. And there's all of our shims, so we want to make sure we keep that in order. Neighbors, guys. They'll be giving us an extra quarter of an inch. That's a tight fit. Okay. So that's junk. That's a needle thrust bearing. what it should look like. So that one's good. Okay. Wrong size fella. There you go. 11 sixteenths. Of course they're not tight. That's not good. I see they're all chewed up. It's also not good. I don't know what happened to this thing. I mean, somebody's obviously been here before, but I think she's had kind of a rough life. Both these bearings are junk, these tapered roller bearings.
Well, there's a special service tool that you need to collapse this clutch, which I don't have, of course. But I think we can do it the, the hard way here. So there were three shims underneath of this snap ring. Try to keep those together. Yeah, we're pretty worn there. That one's not bad. Not bad. Yeah, that one's that one's completely worn through. There we go. Okay, I'm not sure. I'll have to make some phone calls, see what's available for parts, and yeah, make a decision. Because obviously that's not going to work. have an outdoor light and I've come outside before at like 10 or 11 o'clock at night and this whole asphalt pad will be covered with toads and frogs just you know grabbing bugs and flies and insects and stuff that are attracted by the light all right folks it's the next day I was able to get the other clutch apart this is the one that we think was working correctly or it wasn't disengaging but it wasn't slipping and it looks a whole lot better inside all the frictions look good, all the steels look good, and this stack of Belleville washers looks good as well. So I think we can put that one back together, maybe just adjust the shims a little bit, and it'll be good to go. This one is in pretty sad shape. I'm not sure how much of this one we're going to be able to save. The problem is this needle thrust bearing. I don't know if the clutch went bad and then it killed the thrust bearing, or the thrust bearing went bad and then it killed the clutch. but this is the problem. There's little pieces of this cage all over inside this this clutch here and the Belleville washer is all jammed up so it's not actually springing which I think is what was causing the clutch to slip in the first place and then once it started slipping it just self-destructed. But guess what? The customer has a used steering clutch unit out of another machine and I haven't taken it apart, but first glance, it looks like it's in pretty good shape. So I feel, feel confident we're going to have enough parts between the two of them to put one good working unit together. And I may have spoken too soon. Looks like the thrust bearing on this side was starting to go too. See a piece of the race has already broken out. The thrust washer here, so... Yeah, it was headed for the same self-destruct process as the other one, but luckily it hasn't done any damage yet, I don't think. So yeah, should be able to save it. Let's check some, some things here real quick. Alright, the way you're supposed to adjust these clutches, underneath of this big snap ring is a set of shims, and you add shims until the Belleville washers at the back are flat within five thousandths. So if you have a brand new clutch set, you're supposed to do minus five thousandths from the inside to the outside. 
A used clutch set should be no more than positive five thousandths. But you guys probably can't read it. But we have about twenty-five thousandths. Maybe almost thirty. Yeah, let's say twenty-five. So the clutch is worn a little bit. I don't know if we can adjust that with shims. I believe the shims are in 15 or 30 thousandths increments. So we should be able to shim that out. All right guys, I think we've got enough parts here to make one good steering clutch unit, but it's not gonna be easy. One little mystery I've got going on. This is the left side clutch out of the original steering clutch unit. And it has this disc that sat underneath of the Belleville washers. So it actually sits right here. And none of the other units have that disc. So both of the donor units here do not have that disc. It doesn't show up in any of the parts breakdowns in the manuals. I don't know what its purpose is or why it's there, if we, if we need it or not. Also, this is the carrier, center carrier out of the donor. This one's in pretty good shape. The original one, the outside of these teeth was pretty beat up. So we're going to swap that out. Somebody has rebuilt the donor steering clutches. I'm positive of that because it's got a bunch of hardware that doesn't match. See, this has these nylock nuts and the bolts are a, a different length. And somebody's been all over this thing. The roller, the cam rollers here. A couple of them have the wrong hardware. They don't have the lock washers. It's just obvious that somebody's been into it and they haven't put it together exactly right. But I think they replaced the frictions and the steels when they did the, the rebuild because these are in pretty good shape. And they had a lot less shims. These donor clutch packs only had one shim in the top. Whereas the other ones I took apart, the original ones I took apart had uh, three, four, I think one of them even had five shims. And they still weren't tight. So, anyway, I think what we're going to do, we we'll use the steels and frictions out of the donor clutches. We'll use this, whatever you want to call it, center ring end center gear here. We have to use the original ring gear. We cannot change that out unless we had a matching pinion because the pinion and the ring are should have been matched at the factory as a match set so we don't want to mess that up let's see the other actual end housing is junk I think because of the that needle thrust bearing coming apart I don't think we can save that so we're gonna to have to use one of these baskets from the donor which means we're gonna to have to reset our pinion, well, yeah, the running clearance between the pinion and the ring gear and the preload on the bearings, tapered roller bearings on the side. We've got to replace those tapered roller bearings anyway. The ones that came out of it were both junk. Outside. Gotta get that quality B roll footage. Found something. Yeah, kiddo. All right, show everybody how fast you can go. Alright, the last step is to tear down these final drives. I've already done the right side, so I'll bring you guys along for the left side. It's not too bad. Well, this deal here is some kind of a support bushing for the track frame. And I think they've been serviced at some point in time, but... Yeah, there's a bronze bushing inside here. It's, I don't know, I think it's pretty worn out. Well, that's interesting. The 
guess they're all going to do that. Huh. There we go. Now these washers here, they're actually cones. I'll show you one of the ones that came out. So they're actually split on the side and these are cones just like an old truck axle. You need to be careful with these things because they can fly off, shoot clear across the shop, so make sure nobody's downwind of it. There you go. And there's actually a special pair of pliers to deal with these cone-shaped washers or spacers, whatever you want to call them. So it's an OTC 7077. I've had these forever. Because like I said, a lot of older truck axles use this same setup. So that one comes out easily. So it has a little wedge. The wedge goes in the split. And then it expands the spacer as you pull it off. So you don't see that set up very often anymore, but it used to be pretty common. Like I said, on, on truck axles and stuff, you'd see it. So that's why I have these pliers. And actually I see the, the bus grease monkey finally got a set of these. I kept telling him that he needed some. All the joys of working on old equipment. Be good. So here's the pinion gear and the axle shaft for our final drive. And we've got some shims here. We don't want to lose those. That's how they set the bearing preload. There we go. This is just a dust shield. It's supposed to protect this seal. about my air compressor. It's a Quincy 325. It's pretty old. I think it's from the mid 1970s. Anyway on this style of compressor it uses oil pressure to activate the unloader. So basically the compressor head is unloaded until it builds oil pressure and then it closes the unloader and it allows the, the compressor to build air pressure, pump up the tank, and then when the motor shuts off, the electric motor shuts off, the oil pressure goes down and the unloader opens up again. But what's happened recently is when I'm using the compressor a lot, like if I'm using the sandblaster or a needle scaler or a large impact or something and it's running all the time, the unloader every once in a while will open up just in the middle of it running, which means it's not maintaining oil pressure. That's, uh, that's not good.
we go. So there's a surface here on this bowl gear where the seal rides and it's got a heck of a groove worn in it. Probably 60 thousandths, you know, one and a half millimeters deep. So we, we have to do something about that. It's never going to seal. And I think we've got two options. We can machine it down, weld it up, and remachine it to the original diameter. Or we can try to find a speedy sleeve to slip over it. I doubt we're going to find a factory made one, so we may have to make our own. Uh, let's see, the bearings on both sides of this bull gear are bad. But I think the taper roller bearings on the actual axle shaft are okay. Uh, there's another piece over here that has another seal. So there's actually an outside seal and an inside seal. And the inside seal has basically the same kind of damage. Well, I found a problem with the bull gears here from the final drive. So this is the right hand side. This one's okay. This is the left hand side. And this piece here is removable. It's a sleeve that holds the seal. That's not a big deal. The other side has one too. But the casting is actually broken out here that this sleeve is supposed to press into. So, not sure what we're going to do about that yet. This is a, I don't know, kind of a crappy design, I think. I'm not sure if they did this so that you could replace the seal from the outside easily or why they. Yeah, I don't know why they did, th did it this way, but yeah, that's a problem. Well, guess what? The owner has an extra set of final drives. These are out of that same machine, the parts machine that the steering clutches came from. And cosmetically, from the outside, they look a lot worse. But internally, I think they're a lot better. So the gears are intact. You know, this casting's not broken. And the seal journal. This one's got a little bit of a groove, but it's much better than what we had. Same with this little cup right here that the seal, the internal seal rides on. The axle shaft, you know, that seal journal looks good compared to that one, which looks horrible. So that's good. I think we're going to end up using most, if not all, of these spare final drive parts. This one over here, I don't know if it got water in it or what the story is. It's pretty badly corroded, so we're gonna have to clean that up and see see what we have, but I think it's still better than the other final drives, the, the ones we took apart initially. The fine people at Oliver, they sure didn't make these things easy to work on or easy to repair. I got four bearing races here that need to be removed. These bearings are all shot, and they're all pressed into blind bores. There's no access from the backside to drive those races out. So I'm going to show you guys an old trick how we can remove those bearing races without a whole lot of drama. We're going to use this specialty tool from our good friends at Miller, the MIG welder. All you want to do is just run a bead of weld all the way along the inside of that bearing race. And then actually on these big ones I did two beads just because they're so wide. I'll show you what happens. You can see it's loose in there. So you gotta let the thing cool off. Doesn't help you to do it while they're still warm. Which, these are still pretty warm, so I may have to let them cool off. So what's happening here is the same thing that happens when you weld anything. As the weld cools, it contracts, and it basically just shrinks that bearing, and it'll pop right out of the bore. It doesn't have to be a MIG weld. You can use a stick welder or I've even heard guys say you can just take a torch and heat the thing up red hot in a line around the inside and then let it cool and it will shrink. I've never tried that myself, but seems reasonable. So 
So I don't know, maybe everybody already knows this trick, but I remember the first time I saw it when I was just a kid and it blew me away. It's kind of like the first time I ever saw somebody break a ball joint loose by hitting the side of the taper. Because, you know, it, logically, it looks like you ought to just hit the end of the, you know, the thread and it should pop right, up, right loose. But if you've ever worked on ball joints, you know that's not true at all. Anyway, little things you pick up over the years. Yeah, you get the idea. All right, folks, it seemed like a pretty good place to stop. So I think we'll call it the end of part two on the Oliver Crawler. We've finished the disassembly. I've got a little more work to do. I've got to knock some bearing races out, clean some things up, and then we'll kind of go through and, and do an evaluation. You guys might have seen, I put a picture out on the community tab of the disassembly. Had a lot of questions and comments. A lot of people were kind of curious how long it took and how much this was all going to cost. So I'll give you a little bit of an insight. Normally when it comes to large projects like this, you can kind of break it into thirds. So you're going to have one third for your disassembly, one third for cleanup, evaluation, ordering parts, getting everything organized, and then one third for reassembly. So we had about two hours in getting the machine running, loaded on a trailer, brought back to my shop. Another about six hours to get the final drive stripped off and the steering clutches out. And then I've got about another two hours in tearing down the final drives and cleaning up the parts I've already cleaned. So we're about 10 hours into it and I would say we're about halfway done. So that should give you some estimation. As far as parts goes, you know, he had a lot of used parts, so I don't think it's going to be too expensive. We just have to buy a lot of bearings and seals. So, I don't know, probably going to be four or $500 worth of parts. So, yeah, it is not cheap, but, you know, when it comes to industrial machinery like this, that's, that's the way it goes. And we're just lucky that he had those used parts because I, I would be very surprised if there's any new parts available for these machines. You know, maybe you could get somebody to make new frictions and steels, but... I'm not 100% sure what's out there. I had a lot of questions about this little portable fuel tank setup that I use. There's not much to it. All this is, it's a plastic fuel tank out of a lawn tractor. I think it's out of a Cub Cadet, an old Cub Cadet or something. And, you know, it's plastic. I think it holds, I don't know, maybe a gallon and a half, two gallons. It's fairly small. But it has a weird shape because it was actually made to fit around the steering column of that lawn tractor. So I just made this wooden plywood box and stuffed it inside. And then there's a hose that runs right there. Out the bottom of the tank comes up through the side to an electric clickety-clack style fuel pump. So all this is is a little solenoid inside here that just goes back and forth and it makes about, I don't know, four to six PSI, which is good for carbureted engines, it would not work for fuel injection. Typically fuel injection is more like, I don't know, anywhere from 15 to 100 PSI, depending on the setup. But for carburetors, it works great. I've got an electric switch here, so I can turn it on and off. And then I just made these, you know, a lead here with these alligator clips, so I can clip it right to the battery for power. Quarter inch rubber fuel hose. It's got an inline filter. And then I have this little quarter turn shutoff valve just so it doesn't leak fuel all over when I'm not using it. Then I've got a bunch of barb fittings and adapters I've made to fit different styles of carburetors. So it works good for me. Plus it was super, super cheap. You can buy these fuel pumps on eBay. Just, I don't know, look for a low pressure fuel pump, low pressure 12 volt fuel pump, and then find the one that has the right size inlet and outlet. So I don't know, I've seen guys use boat tanks and. I don't know, other cobbled together fuel tanks, but this is what I use. Works pretty good for me.